Good morning, everyone. It's good to be able to be back with you, and uh, I'm excited about where we're going to go in the scriptures this morning and in uh, our look at God's Word and talking about change. And last week we talked about how God, how we respond when change comes into our life, and this week we're going to look at a little bit more about how God changes us. If you have your Bibles, open them up to Joshua chapter 1. We're going to look at the beginning of that story, just a little snippet, and try to glean something from uh, transition and transformation in Joshua's life. I remember my junior year of uh, college, at the very beginning of the year, junior year of college, um, I was with my roommate and we had gone to a concert in, uh, in the school gym. And we were listening to the music, and I remember it just, it was in a time in my life when I was not a very happy person, and just complained about everything, and we go to the concert, and someone had, the, the artist had taken a popular Beatles song and had sung the song in the concert. So we go back to the, my dorm room, our, our dorm room, and we're sitting there, and I just went off for like 10 or 15 minutes about how much you should never play, how a Christian artist should never play secular music. I have a different perspective now, but my point is uh, I just was just brooding and just rah, 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 rah. And at one point my roommate stops and says, you know, Jason, you're not a very compassionate person, are you? Fast forward a month later, I'm sitting in a prayer meeting with people in college with a number of other people, and we're, we're, we're in this room, and um, we're all sitting in these old, old, old chairs, and I remember when I sat down in the chair, I thought, I don't know if this is a good enough chair. I don't know if this chair might be older than the dinosaurs. This is an old, old chair. And at the time, I was a little bit more rotundus, uh, which is a new word I made up, but I was a little bit more rotundus than I am now. And sitting in the chair, and after we were, and we were in the middle of praying, and I remember there were a number of people who were just weeping over the goodness of God, and we felt there was a connection between us and God. It was this beautiful moment, and then all of a sudden, I fell through the chair. I mean, in the middle of this amazing prayer time, I fall through the chair. Now, I tell you that because uh, it wasn't, not, wasn't long after that that I took the incident in the dorm room with my roommate and breaking the chair that I thought to myself, I think there needs to be some changes in my life. I mean, both spiritually, physically, there needs to be an adjustment here. And, and it began, it wasn't overnight, but it began a very slow process of the Lord changing me, of which I am very grateful for. Uh, As I said, last week we talked about why change is challenging, and we said this, that living open-handed allows the disciple of Jesus to accept all seasons of change in life as part of God's gracious uh, provision. And I just want to make one uh, little note for you. Last week, uh, you probably heard me say something like that Jesus gave up his deity when he came to the earth. What I meant to say and should have said was that Jesus did not give up his deity, but he let go of the privileges of his deity. And when Jesus walked the earth, he was still fully God, but he let go of the privileges of his deity. Just want to make sure we clear that up and make sure you know that I have a very high Christology. Anyway, this week, how does God change us? Uh, Pastor Eric Raymond said this about change. It's been said that people hate change. But I don't think that's entirely true. While many people enjoy routines and familiarity, they also also welcome new things. Among things, we like new seasons, we like new restaurants, new technology, new friends, new adventures. This is why I tend to think, this is what he says, I tend to think that it's not change that people resist so much as being changed. It's not that we don't like change, we just don't want to change. This is because it's hard, it's uncomfortable, often humbling and painfully difficult. And we talked a little bit about this last week, but I would tend to agree with Pastor Raymond on this issue um, uh, that at times it becomes difficult for us to change because it means that I'm going to have to, or we don't, I'm sorry, that we have, we wrestle with change because I'm the one that's going to have to be the one that changes. Let me ask you a question. When was the last time you changed your mind about something? And I don't mean like on a movie or a particular flavor of ice cream. I mean something a little bit deeper than that. When was the last time you had a major political shift in your thinking? Like you, and I don't mean necessarily that you changed parties, but maybe you, you changed your mind about a certain political issue. 
when was the last time you changed your mind about a theological issue? Where after years of study, after years of, of thought and hearing teachings and, and whatnot, you changed your mind? Uh, when was the last time you had a major change in life and job and relationship? I would venture to say that the big changes in our life um, are not easy ones, but there is a bit of grind. As we said, change is challenging. And yet, as we also said last week, that it is a part of life. Such was the case for Joshua and the Israelites after the death of Moses, and they began to make their move into the promised land. Let's read Joshua 1 together. It says, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the, uh, the, servant of the, Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea, toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give to them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, that you may <clears throat> be careful to do all according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous." Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. As we get started, let's answer this question first, before we unpack the text just a little bit. Why is it that we want to change? Why, why do we want to change? Why do you want change to come into your life? Why do you want to be able to move on emotionally? Or why do you want to seek out a new job? Why would you go back to school in a season such as this? Why would you start or end friendships? Why, why do we want change? And if you think about Joshua, Joshua has been watching Moses manage the total affairs of Israel for a long time. And he's been a great number two for Moses. He's, he's the assistant manager or the assistant to the manager of the Israelites. And back in Deuteronomy 31, Joshua is commissioned by God to take the place of Moses after he dies. And in that passage, God says to Joshua, be strong and courageous. And now Moses is dead, and he says to Joshua again, how many times? Did you catch it in just these nine verses? How many times does God say to Moses in these nine verses, be strong and courageous? Three times. Now, it is always, this is just good hermeneutics, it is always good to, to notice when God or anyone in the scriptures says something more than once. Jesus, many times in the New Testament, uh, will, will be saying to the people, uh, he'll say, verily, verily, I say to you, which means, right, no, listen to me, listen to everything I'm saying right now. It's the same thing in the Old Testament. Whenever you see a phrase repeated, it's important to take note of. And what does God say to Joshua three times? Be strong and and courageous. Now, why would God need to say this to Joshua three times? Well, Israelites, as many of us as well, are known for needing things to be drilled into our heads. We need to hear the message many, many times before it takes root. Maybe Joshua was distracted at the time of this discussion, and so, you know, God is trying, is he, God trying to get Joshua's attention? I'm not sure. Or maybe, maybe Joshua was about to face challenges that made everything else he had gone through pale in comparison. This is about to be a new day, a new journey, a new season for Joshua and the Israelites. And God says, I need you to be strong and courageous. You think wandering in the desert for 40 years was difficult? Wait until you get into the promised land. Wait until you, you are the one who's in charge leading this group of people. He says, be strong. Now, the, 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 the Hebrew here for strong and courageous, it's a tricky word to translate, but it literally means be strong and courageous. These are not, 
These are not secret words that need uh, you know, some sort of divine tool to understand. These are very blunt terms that Jesus, or the, excuse me, that God says to Joshua. You need to be strong and courageous. And here's, here, here's my opinion, and here's what I think. I think God said it three times to Joshua because Joshua needed to hear it. Because what Joshua was about to face was outside of his ability. I think there needed to be a change in Joshua's life. So I ask this question again. Why do we want to change? Which might sound like an, a question with an obvious answer. You know, why, why do I want to lose weight? Well, I don't like the way I look. Why do I want to go back to school? Well, I want to better my employment. Why do we want to make change? Uh, let's keep it very simple. I think the reason why we want things to change in our lives is because we know something's wrong. Or, at the least, we know that something's not quite right. And it's not what it could be. And so we, we seek out change. So we, you know, we will invest money. We will burn calories. We will upend our personal life in order to see this change come about. Deep down inside, we know something's not right. Uh, it's interesting, in 2016, and I don't have recent stats for you, I apologize, but you can imagine that it's much higher, that in 2016, Americans spent 13 point, Americans, just us, spent $13.6 billion on self-help books. $13.6 billion. Uh, and the estimates are that that number goes up anywhere between 5 and 7% per year. And I was lazy and didn't do the math. You can do it on your own. Why? Why, though, are we spending so much money on self-help? Why are we uh, emptying our pocketbooks? Why are we expending energy on getting better? It's because we think or we believe or we know or people tell us that something's wrong and that we need to fix it. And that's a difficult thing to do. Uh, writer and author Debbie Hampton, uh, who's written extensively on the brain and how it works, she says this, that a lot of our daily actions are automatic. We talked about this a little bit last week. Uh, our daily actions are automatic. Your brain loves autopilot. It's its favorite thing in the world. Uh, your brain loves autopilot, and that, because that's how we conserve energy. Uh, for better or for worse, our habits shape us. Breaking a habit ultimately is about rewiring your brain. Habits are found in the area of your brain called the basal ganglia. The more often you perform an action or behave a certain way, the more it gets physically wired into your brain. She says, when you first try to adopt a new behavior, you have to enlist your prefrontal cortex, which is the part of your brain that makes decisions that is about intentionality, the thinking part, and insert conscious effort, intention, and thought into the process. When you've performed the new routine enough times, it becomes the default pattern. It's no easy task. Listen to me. It is not an easy thing to break a pattern or a default mode of thinking or a way of life that has been drilled and wired into you for a long period of time. Time. It is not an easy thing. But what does she say? How do we go about it? Well, uh, in more of her writing, she says this, that the first thing you need to do is identify what the problem is. What is it that I want to be different? What is it about me that I would like to be different, right? And that comes through, that can come through failure, that can come through someone else pointing it out. Um, you know, as I, I failed, the chair failed me, or maybe I failed the chair. I'm not sure how, exactly how it happened. And then the roommate of mine pointed out uh, the big error in my life. So it's identifying a problem first. Secondly, it's choosing to intervene. There's a conscious choice. I desire to intervene in this problem. I see this thing and I want to take some steps. Now, oftentimes, this is where a lot of us stop. Why? We know there's a problem in our life. We know that there's something wrong. We know that we could do better. We could be better. We could grow. We know that there is work to be done. But we also know, or at least maybe we have some unconscious understanding, that the next step is going to require incredible sacrifice. The next step is going to incredible, great sacrifice of breaking routine, breaking mentality, breaking worldview, breaking things that are wired into us and have been wired into us. 
But she says the next part, though, is to establish a new norm. There has to be a rewiring of our brain. There has to be an intentional choosing of new default patterns of behavior, sacrificing an old way of doing things and building back up new patterns. Why do we want change? We want change because we know, you and I both know, that there's things in our life that we'd like to be better. We want to see growth. We want to see victory. We want to see things be different. Now, that's why we want change. But why would God want to change us? Why would our Heavenly Father want us to change? Now, throughout the history of Israel up to this point, there's been a common theme that characterizes God's relationship with the people. It's not just that they are the people. Ready? They are his people. Common theme all throughout the scriptures, that Israel is his people. He loves them because they are his children. He is patient and forgiving of them. He disciplines them uh, and chastises them because he loves them. Not out of some sort of anger or hate, but because he loves them. He leads them. He provides for them. He's made covenant with them, signed in blood. They are his people. I mean, listen to the way that God speaks to Joshua in, uh, beginning in verse 3. He says, Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you just as I promised Moses. Do you see the covenant language there? Do you see the relational language? God is saying, I have given you this land. Everywhere that you go, just as I made promises to Moses, I'm making promises to you. In verse 5, he says, No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was what? With Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Verse 8, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have what? Good success. God desires for good success to be in the Israelites' path, in their life. Verse 9, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. This is relational covenant language that God is using with Joshua. He is not just saying, all right, look, I got something for you to do. Here's steps A, 9, 12, and 37. That doesn't make sense, but go do it. Figure it out. Let me know when you're done. He says, here, I, here, here's what it is. I want you to go into the land. I want you to take it. I want you to possess it. I need you to be strong and courageous. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to be with you every step of the way. There's covenantal language here. God, Joshua is going to have to step up to the plate, though, isn't he? And God is promising to be there. So why does God want us to change? Listen to this. God wants us to change. God wants, to, excuse me, God wants to change us because he loves us too much to let us stay the same. Let me say that again. God wants to change us because he loves us too much to let us stay the same. Yes, God loves you just the way that you are, but he also loves you in spite of who you are. You know, it's interesting with my own children, there's, there's things about my children that I, I want to see different. I want to see them grow. I want to see them mature. And the reason why I continue to speak into their life and discipline them and, and come alongside them is because I, I love them. I, I love my, my daughters and my son, and I love them for who they are because they're my children, and I love loving them, and I enjoy it, but I also know what their potential is. I know where, I know that I want them to, I want to see them grow and mature. I'm not just, you know, showering them with stuff and saying, okay, good luck. I'm actually walking with them throughout their entire lives. That's the same way with God. God wants to change us, wants to see us change because he, uh, he has intention of us growing and maturing because the more that you and I become uh, like God more and we reflect his image, the better we reflect his character in the world and the closer we're able to draw to him. Do you understand? You, you do understand this, right? That as we continue to grow in uh, the image of God, that we can become more and more close to him, that we can experience him. That's why at our church we stress so much the spiritual practices of things like prayer and Bible study and solitude and fasting and, and, and a number of other things. We, we stress those things because not because that's the good Christian thing to do, but because those things draw us closer into the presence of God and bring spiritual maturity. And listen, God is not waiting 
for us to get to heaven to make us like him. And nor do, should we wait either. Why does God want to change us? Number two, he loves us too much to make us change on our own. So he says to Joshua, I'm going to be with you. Be strong and courageous. I'm going to be with you. That's why God gives us the Holy Spirit so that we are not just expected to grow in our discipleship by ourselves, but that we have, as Jesus calls in the New Testament, a helper, a guide, a counselor to go with us. We have that person, that, the presence of God in us, because we're not expected just to figure it out on our own. Gosh, that's one of the worst things you can tell someone if you come alongside them and say, I think there needs to be change in your life. I think there needs to be something different in the way that you live, in the way that you behave or see the world. And then you send them on their way and say, okay, now go figure it out. <laughs> I've told you what you need to do, but you have to figure it out on your own. I mean, that would be cruel if God asked us to do that. But he doesn't. He doesn't. He doesn't expect us to do it on our own. So how does God change us? Well, first he identifies the problem. That there's something missing in our life, isn't it? Which is him. Which is more of his presence. That there is a, there's a flaw in us. There's things that are missing. And what does God do? God chooses to intervene, doesn't he? God chooses to step into human history, human life, and says, I, I see the problem, I see this, this thing, this sin that is wrecking and destroying not just the world, but you as well. You as an individual, I see this sin that's wreaking havoc on your soul, on your heart, on your mind, on your marriage, on your life, on your, on your everything. And I will not just stand by. So I will step in. I will intervene. I will send my son, Jesus Christ, to live this earth, to live in a way that is not only a model, but is the way that we all are to live. It's our ability to live. And he is going to step in and be sacrificed on our behalf. And see, one of the things about being a Christian is that God establishes a new norm in us, right? As a Christian, God gives us a new norm, a new default. God rewires our spiritual mind to give us a new way to think and act and brings about the change. If you look at Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, this will be up on the screen behind me. Paul says this. He says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of my, mankind. Here's the problem. God identifies the problem. That you and I were dead spiritually. We were enemies of God. Paul gets even more blunt and explicit in the book of Romans and in other places where we are absolutely separated, dead. We are just, we are nothing but ready for the fire on our own. God identifies the problem. And then in verse 4 it says, But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. And raised, not only made us alive, but raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no man may boast. What is this? This is God choosing to intervene. This is God stepping in and saying, okay, here's the, my people, and they are lost, and they are dead, and I choose to intervene. I choose to step in. I am making a conscious choice to rescue them and bring, back, bring them back. And then verse 10, for we are his workmanship, or some translations say works of art. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for what? For good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Here is our new normal. We talk about in our culture today, in our society, that we're all living through a new normal. And we could have a whole discussion on whether or not that's a good way to put it. But let me tell you something. God gives us a new normal in his son, Jesus Christ. 
God brings a new way of thinking and living and carrying out every day-to-day activity through Jesus Christ. That means that you and I can change. That means that we are not forever stuck. We'll talk more about why why else God wants to do this next week. But to close, I just wanted to talk about how you and I can embrace this change in our lives. You know, last week, again, we talked about being open-handed. And I'd say for this week, that's a good place to start. It reminds us that I am always in need of change. Uh, the, 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 the big holy word for that is sanctification, a, a change that God makes us more. It's a process of how God makes us more and more and more into the likeness of his son. And so and being open-handed means I'm, I'm open to change, and I'm open to whatever God wants to do. Now that is an easy thing to say, but man, that is a difficult thing to live out. I know that personally. It is a difficult thing. It is no easy task to live open-handed before God. But from here, let me just offer you a few uh, questions that might be helpful just as takeaway to consider if God is calling you to make changes in your life. These actually come again from Eric Raymond uh, from uh, his uh, writing on change. And he offers three questions that I think are very helpful. The first one is this. Am I aware of the change that God wants to bring? Am I aware? Do I see it? Do I sense it? Do I feel it? Uh, Are others bringing it to my attention? Do people say, hey, things need to be different in your life? And one of the ways that you can be aware of that change that God wants to bring into your life is through prayer and fasting and and scripture reading and meditation. These are ways that we can open ourselves up to God. I would say this, in in order to be aware of what God is doing, you have to be aware of God. Um, I can tell you that as a pastor, I've, I've had many conversations with people who feel like they're stuck and feel like nothing's happening in their life. God just seems distant. And pastorally, I ask them the question, well, tell me about your prayer life. Tell me about your time in the Word. Tell me about, you know, just your, your spiritual practices. And there are none. Or very little. And, and that may be in a place that you're at right now. And if that's the case, today is a great day to start something new. Today is a great day to start something new. You do not have to be limited by your old choices or past performance. But today is a great day for change. Amen? Great day for change. We have to be aware of God. You know why? Because he's aware of us. And I mean that in the best way. He's aware of you. He knows you. He sees you. Second question to ask is, am I resistant to that change in any way? Am I resistant? What am I holding on to? Close close hands. What sin needs to be confessed? Why am I resistant? Uh, What is it that I'm putting out in front of God that I say, this has to happen or else? And finally, um, what am I doing to pursue this change? What are the habits that I'm rebuilding into my life? Keep this in mind. God has done the heavy lifting, right? God has done all of the heavy lifting in Jesus Christ. You and I do not bring about great change in our life because we're super committed. Change comes into our life because Jesus Christ made it possible. But I want us to remember that we have a role to play as well. We have things that we might need to do. And part of that is just starting Day one, okay, God, I'm going to be open-handed. God, would you bring people into my life? God, I need to actually start listening to these people in my life. God, I need to actually start letting go of habits or, or things that are not helpful to me. We have a role to play as well. And let me just say this. It's okay to ask for help. It's okay. In fact, it is a healthy thing. It is a spiritually healthy thing to ask for help. Here's what I want us to take away from today. The change God wants to bring into our life is intended to make us more 
into the likeness of his son, which is the primary way that he is bringing change into the world, which we'll talk about more next week. And so maybe you're someone who has been stuck for a while. Maybe you're someone who is beginning to believe that there will never be change in your life, that things are just going to be the same the way they always are. You're always going to be on the fringes in terms of your relationship with God. You're always going to be in an unloving marriage. You're always going to have kids that just that rebel against you. You're always going to be the rebellious kid. You're, it's just always going to be like that. And I want you to know that through God, through the, the, the death of his son, Jesus Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can see change in our life. And I'm not telling you what's going to happen today or tomorrow. I can't predict that. I'm not God. I am limited by all of this, okay? But what I can say from the scriptures and from what, I'm see- what I have seen in life and from my own life, that change is possible. We just need to submit ourselves completely to God for that change. Anyone can change with God in his life, his or her life, and anyone can see a new day with the power of God behind them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we have these truths to hold on to. That God, we can, we can rest, we can trust, we can know that change is possible. God, I am thankful to know that Who I am today is not who I was 20 years ago in college. And who I am today is not who I'm going to be 20 years from now. God, I I pray for myself and for my friends at home that whatever is in our life that needs to be different, whatever spaces, whatever pieces of our life need work, need to change, need to be let go, that we just sense are not right. God, all of those sharp edges, we ask and pray that you would, by your Holy Spirit, transform us. By your Holy Spirit, make us new. Teach us how to live open-handed and to believe with all of our hearts of your goodness, your faithfulness to be with us Just as you were with Joshua, you will be with us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Anyone can see change happen in their life when God is a part of it. Anyone can experience that. That you are not stuck forever in your circumstances. That God can bring great change. Next week, we're going to be talking about how we, as his people, can bring change into the world. And so I invite you to be with us next week. We'll be gathering tonight at 4 and 6 o'clock for our outdoor gatherings. Hope to see you there. God be with you this week as you wait on his goodness and his faithfulness to come into your life, to bring change into your life, and to be change in the world around you. God bless. Take care.